Hey guys, welcome back to AFK Discussions. It's your boy Jason. And with me is Phil. How's it going, dude? Good, good, man. How are you? How was your week? Doing great, doing great, great. I can't even talk. Remember we talked about this before? I need to start I doing told voice you, you exercises. You have to do your exercises. You I still know. have yet to do them. <laughs> I you have just it. hanging out before the show. I don't know what you do. You're just hanging out. <laughs> All right, guys. So I wanted to tell you real quick to go check us out wherever you do social media. That's Instagram, Facebook, X, TikTok. As of now, we still don't know if it's going to be around forever, but I guess we'll see. Um, also, check out our sponsor, <laughs> That is fattac.com. They have all your needs. If you're a big dude or a small dude and you need tactical gear, go check them out. That's fattac.com. All right, let's get right into it. Phil, I'm going to turn it over to you, man. So we have a very special guest this week, uh, a Bridgewater Triangle expert, a person that's been researching the Bridgewater Triangle, investigating the Bridgewater Triangle um, for a long time, has a plethora of knowledge. Kristen Evans, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so why don't you tell everyone just a little bit about yourself? Um, you know, there's a lot to get into, I'm sure, but yeah, the floor is yours. Okay, sure. So um, I got into the Bridgewater Triangle around 2009. I grew up in the Bridgewater Triangle, but had no idea what it was. Um, I had a lot of experiences growing up. Um, saw UFOs. We would see glowing red eyes in the woods. Um there was this story when I was six years old, 1976, about this monster dog in two towns over from me. And on the news, it said this monster dog was on the loose. It was covered in blood. And I was horrified. And I climbed up on a hemlock tree and stayed there for like eight hours. I was sure this monster dog was going to come down my street. And then... Years later, every time I asked anybody if they remembered this, nobody remembered it. And I started to think I even just imagined it. And then around 2009, um, I was going to a birthday party and my friend's daughter was really into the paranormal. And I got her a book called Weird Massachusetts. And before the party, I was skimming through it. And lo and behold, there's a whole chapter about the Bridgewater Triangle. And I just got hooked. I said to myself, this kind of explains a lot of my experiences. And one of the stories that they mentioned was that black dog of Abington. And then I realized that it was not a figment of my imagination. And um, I had moved out of the area for about 15, 20 years. I was in the Boston area. When I started a family, I moved back to Hanson. Hanson has a lot of rich Native American history. But growing up, none of us questioned it, why our schools were all named after Indian names and our streets. Um, but when I moved back to Hanson, we bought an old farmhouse that was haunted. And I started to wonder about the Native American history. So I simultaneously got into research about the Bridgewater Triangle and this local Native American research, and it kind of just overlapped. And as you know, it completely overlaps. One has a lot to do with the other. So that's the basic gist of it. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I didn't know you had the the dog encounter. You don't really hear many people talk about that one. But yeah. Yeah, that, well, I didn't see it. I heard it yeah. on the news. Yeah, yeah. Was, yeah, 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 but that was you said like mid seventies. So um, that's just a, a, such a strange one because that's the one that hasn't really carried over um, to nowadays. You haven't really seen any too many reports of that. I guess maybe in Freetown, but not necessarily. Well, you know what? Surprisingly, like in the last couple of years, there have been a couple of hellhound reports. Ooh, interesting. And one is one was by a good friend of mine, and I totally trust her. She was hiking through this very strange um, area that's known for having strange things happen in it. It's a forest called Ames Knoll Park in Abington. Yep. Yes. And yeah. she was hiking with her dog and all of a sudden she just saw this herd of deer running like they were afraid of something and she saw this huge massive dog chasing it and a couple other reports too, so. Yeah, no, that's wow. super interesting. Uh, that's a, such an interesting um, um part of the Bridgewater Triangle as far as the cryptids go, you know, is it a real dog? Is it a, some sort of cryptid animal? Is it, you know, what exactly is this thing? Have you ever read about this, Phil? 
No, I I haven't really heard about that one at all. No, that's so, definitely one of the lesser known ones for sure. Well, it was pretty popular. It's like uh, back in the day, it was one of La- like Lauren Coleman's original stories that he wrote about in the Bridgewater Triangle. Yeah. Um, basically, this little girl came out to feed her ponies at like six o'clock in the morning, and her ponies were all tangled in their tethers. And this dog that was as big as the ponies was eating their throats out and they were dead. Oh, gosh. And the dog was covered in blood. The ponies were Shetland ponies, so Mm -hmm. they weren't like regular sized ponies. But still, um, this dog was acting in a way that dogs usually don't act. And her father was a firefighter. She ran in. He came out. I think he came out at first with a baseball bat, and that did not upset the dog at all he was just kept eating then he came out with his shotgun and he shot at it and it missed and then the dog was on loose for three days they um escorted kids to school with like rifles and it was like they got over a thousand phone calls there was an incident where a little boy shot his sister in a barn because he thought that she was the dog it was like this big panic the strange thing is so this went on for three days and where it was last sighted was like within a half a mile of where it first appeared. And they tracked it down to railroad tracks and an officer shot right down the railroad tracks. And again, it missed. And he said the dog was unfazed and just kept walking down the tracks. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me how you could miss a shot so easy or let that animal go but that's how the policeman left it and i feel like something weird happened that he just doesn't want to talk about like maybe it just disappeared i don't know right yeah definitely that's super fascinating yeah that's interesting too no thank you for sharing that yeah i didn't know that i bought i bought the book but i haven't actually read every single thing yet i was like i'm working my way through the lauren coleman book but yeah such a there's so many things in that book uh, that I didn't didn't know about, like all of, even just like um, like there's a few like large I don't want to say snakes, but uh, like sea serpent type in a few ponds and stuff. One of them was like Silver Lake in where is that Ta- Kingston? Or, Kingston, yeah, 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 Silver Lake. Oh, I haven't there. heard that one. Yeah, it's it. He has it listed in his book. It's Are you talking like, about Mysterious America? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one. Yeah, Mysterious oh. America. Oh. Yeah, yep. I kind of just read the chapter on the triangle and that. Uh, um, oh, yeah. So I was just looking through it, like, because he in the back, he has it, like, listed by creature and where they've been sighted and, and stuff like that. So, like, apparently there's, like, some sort of sea serpent that was spotted at some point in Silver Lake. And there was a couple other spots I was like, oh, I didn't know that. But, yeah, oh, just... That- I'm yes. fascinated. That's one of my yeah. areas of research is sea, is sea serpents. Really? People don't realize how many sea serpent sightings there were in the South Shore. The North Shore gets all the attention, the Gloucester Sea Serpent. Yeah. Um, there were I have hundreds of accounts in my uh, folder on sea serpent sightings from Boston to Provincetown. Hundreds. And they all kind of just disappeared around 1940. Not many yeah. sightings, although there was a sighting, um, one washed up in Situate, which is um, in relation to the Triangle, uh, maybe seven miles east. Mm-hmm. And that was in the 70s, and yeah, that was a big thing. That, that was the last time. Yeah, super interesting. It makes you wonder if, they're, if they are still around or, you know. I mean, they, they might be, like... As far as the sea creatures go, I mean, the, the ocean is very vast. So the you know, Lord knows what's in there as far as... Well, what struck me when I was researching is most of the reports came from s- seamen, fishermen. Mm-hmm. You'd think that they'd know the difference. Yeah. You know, course, some yeah, were right. spotted from the shore, but most of them were from, like, people that lived on the sea, so... Yeah, and they would you think they would know best and be like, oh, they would know what fish look like and, or, you know... You would think. Like yeah, definitely. So, yeah, no, super fascinating. Now, as far as Bridgewater Triangle, do you have a favorite hot spot? Hey, r- as real far quick. As, like, your favorite place? Oh, go ahead. You have real a question? Quick, before, before we get in there, I, so I had a thought about the Black Dog. Um, so, oh, I love it. Yeah. 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 So the Appalachian Mountains, you know, go all the way from, is it Florida? Georgia, I know at least 
all the way up to, um, gosh, Canada, I think. It ends in Canada, right? The yeah. Appalachian mm-hmm. Mountain Trail or train. Um, so in Tennessee, in the Smoky Mountains, we have legends of black dogs also. And that's a big part of the folklore of the in in the hills here. Um, so they're 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 like a harbinger of um, of death and destruction, kind of like the Mothman ish. But um, there's been you know a bunch of folk folklore about um, these black dogs, which also is kind of interesting since you know this mountain chain goes all the way up to you guys. So I don't know if it's part of the same sort of. Um, same sort of like creature. Oh, or, that's an you know, interesting it, it, theory. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. 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 You never know. You yeah. never know. That's for sure. Yeah. A lot of things are, I think are more connected than we realize in, in far as stuff like that, for yeah. sure. Especially even when you start talking about like native American tribes and stuff, it's interesting. A lot of them have like the same kind of legends and stuff. Yeah. Um, that Definitely. are like far away from like, each other. Like Pukwudgies like, oh, kind of and then the Cherokee yeah. little people. Right. Right. Yeah, Which, yeah, I mean, yeah, right. Exactly that. And now that, exactly you know, that, that. makes sense, yeah. you know, because we've already always tried to connect the two, the Pukwudgie and the little people. And now I yeah. think maybe we're making a connection with the Appalachian Mountain mm. train, which would make sense. The, yeah. 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 That, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. For sure. Absolutely. No. Yeah. And about Pukwudgies, it's really interesting because the description, descriptions of them um, are not the same descriptions as the Wampanoag mythology which describe them, like you said, Jason, like little people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, um, people say like it had like this, look like an old, like human-like face and or it was covered in fur. I mean, it's, n- nobody really has identical descriptions of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's weird because um, even with like... Um, the Algonquins, they have like a bunch of different names for them. You know, there's the Muka Wisug, which are like little, the like just like you were saying, like little people. But then the Pukwudgie name came, came from like Maryland, a like Maryland Algonquin tribe. And then they used it up here. So it's like the names were kind of all, it seems like the names kind of got either all like the Pukwudgie just kind of took over as everyone just called it a Pukwudgie instead of these other names. I don't know how it works, but. Or well, what I know they were using but, the term, um, Pukwudgie. Yep. Since at least the 1800s in this area. Yep. Um, someone should write a book about this though, yeah. and get just all the comparisons and try to connect the dots. It's really interesting. Oh, for sure, definitely, yeah. Because like it, like Jason was saying, they have the the Tennessee little people, which have like similar characteristics to like Pukwudgies or little people up here. Like even the same similar kind of stories. Like down there, they're broken into like three different categories. Whereas up here, they're kind of just like one thing. And it's just weird. It's interesting. Um, the different, the similarities and the differences between all the different like claim or legends of these little people, mm-hmm. which I think is super fascinating. I do know that uh, local tribes around here, Southeastern Mass, um, they totally believe in them. And they believe that you don't say the word or you will attract them. And I do know three Native American tribal members of two different tribes that have all had visitation. Hmm. One in Massasoit State Park in, uh, I think it's Taunton. Mm -hmm. One in someone's bedroom. And then the other one was at a powwow down the Cape. Hmm. So it's not just like this old legend thing. It's something that's still very um, much in their consciousness and their cultural beliefs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. It's interesting that they it's carried it's carried over all this this whole time. Yeah, definitely, you know? definitely. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, yeah. So about Pukwudgies, um, have you done a lot of like uh, as far as when you've been like because you, you done paranormal investigations and stuff like that? Have you had any encounters where you would be like that would make you think this is possibly a Pukwudgie or? Things that maybe happen because you know they're known to be tricksters. You ever had any moments where you've been out investigating somewhere and been like, "I thought, I thought I did, I thought I did something, but something wasn't where it's supposed to be." Yeah, or, you I've know, had stuff, a, couple, stuff I've had like a that. couple of experiences. I don't know if I feel comfortable talking about them. I'll talk about I'll talk about one. Um, Freetown Forest is a place I've avoided the whole time I've researched the Bridgewater Triangle. I ended up there in November and. 
I was with two other people and we just had the strangest experiences. Um, one of the experiences that we had was my friend put his fist up and he was like, back off. And what I was looking at was nothing. And then within minutes, both of them were like, oh my God, I can't even believe that happened. And I was like, what, what? And they both looked at each other like, you're kidding me. You didn't see that. And I was like, see what? They're like, it was a gigantic buck charging at us. And they're like, wait a second, you didn't hear that? And I'm like, hear what? <laughs> and they're like, it sounded like a freight train. You literally didn't hear that? I'm like, no. And at the time, I was just bummed out that I didn't get to see this massive buck. Yeah, right. But looking back on the whole day and everything that happened, it was strange. Um, uh, and I was watching a video about puck wedgies in the last couple of days, and they mentioned something similar, like one person will see something, but the other person won't. And I thought that's weird. And then they also mentioned something about... Um, them hiding things and putting, taking your things and putting them in a different spot. And on that day, when we got out to the car, my friend looked in his knapsack and said, oh my God, my keys are not in here. Now it's 4.15, it's 15 minutes before it's going to be pitch black. And I do not want to go back in that forest, but I'm thinking we're going back in that forest. We looked everywhere in the car and... We just started heading to the trailhead. And then my other friend was like, found them. And we were like, what? Came back to the car. We were like, where were they? They were in the back seat console that, you you know, the, we have mm -hmm. like cup holders. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. had been upright the entire time. It was almost like as if something wanted to go us to go back in. Mm -hmm. And um yeah, it was it was a really creepy day. The other experience, I really don't want to get into too much about it. I was I was the contact person for when the Discovery Channel came here. They were doing an episode on puck wedgies and the whole thing just it the whole thing blew up. They had to pick a different subject. They were already out here. And um two of the Native American people that I got, they both have visitation. And they were like, we're out. And then I felt guilty because I talked my like I talked my friend into doing this when she was very apprehensive. She's like, I've told you, like, we don't speak this name. And so one person had visitation, they backed out. She had visitation, she backed out. Um, and then I was I started to be affected. And it's just too weird to say, I'm like, I don't want to talk about it, mm -hmm. but it can communicate with you via um electronics let's just put it that way mm -hmm. i was yeah. i was stalked for about 24 hours it was really scary it was one of the creepiest things that's ever happened to me yeah no doubt it sounds like it sounds like it well we appreciate you sharing that for sure yeah definitely. um yeah the, the puck wedges are just uh they are they're crazy that's for sure and the freetown state forest is a dark place and i don't think a lot of people like realize how dark it is or they like try to brush it off like oh yeah you know like it's just a great place to walk around it's like no man it is not you know like i do investigations and i've only been there like three times and that's on purpose just like you said i don't like to go there either because that place does have a totally totally different like evil vibe than any place else in the Bridgewater triangle yeah it's i don't like really have a lot of experience there. with it the place mm -hmm. that i was investigating or i was walking was actually on the outskirts of the forest it wasn't even like nowhere near the ledge or any of like gotcha. the places that okay. everybody goes um i just knew when i first started researching the Bridgewater triangle that everything that they say happened and they really happen and i'm an empath and I don't want to be feeling anything. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. No, I get it. It's not satanic panic. It's not a myth. It's all very real. I can just tell you that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. 100%. Yeah. I, I believe it's real. Day, yeah. All very yeah. real. Yeah. Yeah. No, I believe I 100% believe it. Um, because you'd, all you got to do is spend like two seconds in that forest and, you know, you're like, okay. 
Yeah, there's something yeah. not right about it. I will, <laughs> yeah, I, that's I'm not planning on never going back. Yeah, there, that there was, is something. Like, I, I did. I was like, I can't even believe I did this. Like, I've been, I'm successfully avoiding coming here. And yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I've heard, I've heard uh, you're not the only person that said that they've had, they've had like negative things happen there specifically. at the And negative world. things afterwards, starting almost yeah. immediately to all three of us yeah. that are still going on to this day, like mm-hmm. months later. You, you, yeah, it totally. Yeah. It, 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 it was really strange. We won't yeah. be doing that again. Yeah, yeah. Right. I don't blame you. I don't blame you. I'll yeah. save it for the diehards. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, so I recently did, uh, well, it hasn't come out yet, but I recently checked out the, the legend of the redheaded hitchhiker. Um, oh, excellent. I just, yeah. I just think it's such a fascinating, like tale. Um, you know, obviously as far as where the origins and the furthest back I could find was like the sixties, late sixties yeah. or like the first accounts of this happening of the redheaded hitchhiker. Um, have you checked into that uh, as far as like researched it at all? Like I couldn't come up with much of anything beyond that point as far as like if this guy was a real person, who if who he was, what the you know what who this possibly could be. Um, you know, I just think it's a really fascinating story. It is. Um, right now, I'm working on a book about legends, legends of the Bridgewater Triangle, and I'm working on that chapter right now. Um, it's about the redheaded hitchhiker and the author of a lot of the ghost stories and legends that come out of Rehoboth and um, that area. Hold on. Let me see if I, uh... It's so weird. Like that you're asking this question. She's working on it currently. You know, right. that's very, yeah, right. that, is, yeah. that is cool. This is the book. Okay. Cool. This is a cult classic. It's out of print. I'm lucky to have like three copies. The author died. Um, I don't know, maybe six or seven years ago, died young. He was only 50, 54, 55. Jeez, that is um, Charles Turek Robinson was a Harvard-educated anthropologist and archaeologist, and he really didn't have any interest in the Well, he didn't have any interest in the paranormal at all. Um, but also, he was a writer, and he liked, to, uh, liked legends. And he used to submit a lot of work to and get published um, in Yankee Magazine a lot. And for a Halloween article, he knew of this house in Rehoboth where Hans Holzer had been interested in and was um, trying to help this couple who had a poltergeist in the house. And he wrote this article in the early 90s about this house and about how Hans Holzer was, you know, the pioneer, original ghost hunter and his connection to Rehoboth and after that, um, I had the opportunity to talk to him before he died. I'm glad I did. Um, he said that people from Rehoboth were just like, when they read it in Yankee Magazine, were like, oh, my God, like, I have a story. I need to tell him this. And then all of a sudden, the editor at Yankee Mag- Magazine kept getting letters addressed to Charles Turek Robinson. And they were like, this is what happened to me. This is what happened. And then there were so many that he was like, wait a second. And he started seeing like motifs, like the redheaded hitchhiker one. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he decided to interview all of, all of these people. And he interviewed about 200 people. There's, I think, 57 he chose in here. Um, he eliminated a lot of them that he felt were just like attention seekers. Sure. He interviewed... Um, the people that he took seriously three times to make sure that their story didn't change at all. Um, so he's the one who came up with the story about the redheaded hitchhiker. For years, I thought that all the legends of the hitchhiker were just in this book and that's it. And then a production company contacted me and they wanted to do a segment on the redheaded hitchhiker. And I said, you're not going to really find anyone that's seen, seen him. And I'm like, I'll put it out there on my Facebook, but nope. Like it's not even a thing anymore. It's like it, they used to have sightings. Well, to my surprise, Oh my God, there have been so many sightings, modern day sightings, like to this day. And they're basically all the same. The person thinks they're going to hit him mm-hmm. or um, they pull over to give him a ride or make sure he's okay because he looks weird and he just disappears. 
there haven't been any stories about him like being in the car, like the ones that are in the book. Um, who was he? For a while, I thought, you know, maybe he was somebody that got hit by a car or, um, I don't know. He doesn't seem like a ghost to me, though. He seems more like a demon mm -hmm. from the way he looks and he behaves. And, and I don't know. He is. Huh? And now, like, how strong he is, too. You know, to do, to do, to manifest so, like, so strongly like that. They would, you'd say and, yeah, and he likes to torture people, it yes, seems. And, and the laugh. Now, what's really interesting about this, now, it's kind of a spoiler alert because this video is not going to come out for, like, three weeks. So, you know, just like you, I was like, oh, right ahead of Hitchhiker, it's a cool story. At the very least, it's a cool story to retell, even if I don't, we don't catch anything as far as evidence while we're doing it. Oh, um, so we're out there. And we caught on an EVP, we caught a laugh and it was like a creepy guy laugh. Exactly how you would, you would think it would sound as far as it's described in the story. We caught it right at the Seekonk Rehoboth or no. Are you Seekonk. serious? Yes. Right at the line. I was like, I was what, like, Here's, what video was this on? Um, I have, it hasn't come out yet. It comes out in two weeks. Ooh. So I caught like, like I said, I caught his laugh and then on the, what's this? It's so weird. Yeah, so we caught that, and then um, I'm trying to think what there was another part of it that I wanted to tell you, but the laugh itself, that creeped me out. I was like, wow, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. But yeah, that was shocking. That's amazing. I can't yeah. wait to hear it. That was shocking. That was shocking. And then I'm trying to think, there was something else I wanted to say about it. Because um, we caught a couple other word bank responses that were quite particular with the with the story itself. And then um, the, the girl I did the video with, Jessica, from cryptid, oh man, I don't want to get this wrong. A uh, general tidbits and cryptid, cryptid tidbits or something like that. I get, the, I always butcher the name. Sorry, Jessica, but she came out with us on that night, and she did a lot. She was like digging deep, and she like found one rumor of a name of the guy that it possibly was, and it was like Herbert Red, and it was just like a rumor. It's not even anything that's like concrete. Hmm. So she's telling this it's story in the car, and. We're like, this is right before Rehoboth. We're not even quite in Rehoboth. But uh, on EVP, we get Herbert Red. Right after oh. she says Herbert Red, we're like, I'm, we're sitting there and I'm like, oh, okay. And then I ask her about her spirit box and then EVP, Herbert Red. Hmm. And I'm like, are, are they just copying what we're saying? Like, that could be possible. But I mean, it was kind of weird to get that. I'm so curious about where she came up with the, the theory and that name. Me too. I have to ask her because I was, you know, doing some, I was doing some digging to try to find out. And she was like, it's just a rumor. It's not even anything concrete. I know that there's like a new um, theory circulating around that he was a patient at Taunton State Hospital. Mm -hmm. um, and he was like a homeless person. Um, the dates don't add up though. The site, the sighting started in the sixties. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. But it's interesting because I never really thought about it, like, until I started writing this chapter. And I was thinking there must be, like, other stories like this across the country, I bet. Yeah, and when right. I looked oh. into it, yeah, the, sh all, the whole world, um, it seemed to start with Chicago Mary. I'm sure you're familiar with that, Resurrection Mary. Yeah. No, I don't think I – you know that one, Jason? Yeah, I know that one, yeah. Okay. No, I don't know that one. So it like started in um, around like the World War II era, mm -hmm. and she would appear like in dance halls, and a man would go to take her home, and then she'd like disappear out of the car mm -hmm. in front of the cemetery, or she'd say, "Oh, I'm going to get out here," and then disappear. There's a lot of similarities um, with the redheaded hitchhiker I found. Mm. Yeah, that's true. The way that you know, usually ghosts don't like get into cars and sit down and look so you know, look like regular yeah. people, but uh, people say they still see her and the Chicago Historical Society accepts it yeah. as a well, at least a great legend. <laughs> yeah, no, that that's super fascinating. No, the whole the the whole hitchhiker thing is super fascinating. Like I said, it blew me away. Um, you know, because we were thinking because he had the flannel on, well, like reports of flannel. They're like, oh, maybe because there was a couple old lumber mills in that area. So we're like, all right, well, maybe he was an old lumber jack, some sort of accident or something. So we drove down off of 44 and kind of like went down in that area. Um, didn't really get anything pertaining to him, but we did get some other things in the spirit box. Kind of weird. Um, but I mean, it's Rehoboth. Rehoboth is 
um, definitely a haunted town for sure. So like you well, know, all of Route 44 is all yeah, messed yeah, up. And like yeah. the proximity to Anawan Rock too, that yes. swamp. Yes. That's, yes. you know, everyone talks about the Hockamock Swamp and everything happens in the Hockamock Swamp. All the swamps are, were used by the powwows, all of them. That That's mm-hmm. that's where they would contact the underworld and it was the closest place to, you know, um, speak with their ancestors. And it just it just wasn't Hockamock Swamp. It was Sequanic Swamp. I think I'm saying that right. That's where Anwan Rock is. That was like, a very special place. Um, yeah, really, really weird area. There's so many um, stories from Rehoboth that mostly come from Charles Turk Robinson's book. But it's an old town. I think there's 53 cemeteries in it and with a very, very, very small population. Um, it's a place where I saw one of the two solid full apparition ghosts um, that I've ever seen in my life. The first was when I was a kid. Um, but me and my friend went to the cemetery looking for this ghost called Ephraim that's supposed to hate women. And he's supposed to swear at women. And oh. I was an idiot and I'm going, come on out, Ephraim. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> come on. We didn't see anything. Well, Ephraim didn't come out. We pull out of the cemetery drive down the street where the cemetery is next to it. You can see the cemetery. And we look over and there's this man dressed in 1800 or 1700s clothes, coattails, bare feet, filthy. Like he looked like he just came out of the ground, right? Um, His pants were too short and his the way he moved wasn't natural. It was like, it was shake. He was like sh- wavy or shaky, mm-hmm. yet looked solid. And my friend's like, oh, I wonder if there was a play or something today. And he's an actor and she's a skeptic. And I'm thinking, the guy can barely stand up. I don't think he's been <laughs> getting yeah, on any stage today <laughs> or whatever. But yeah, Rehoboth is loaded. It's probably mm-hmm. right up there with like, Salem for hauntings. Yeah, just like just lesser known. Yeah, yep. you know what I mean. Because Salem is, you know, everyone knows about Salem, and you know. And then another people. really interesting thing about Rehoboth, um, this I love this. Um, I often wondered years ago if H.P. Lovecraft was inter- like influenced by the Bridgewater Triangle. Providence is not far from Rehoboth, as you know, or the yeah. Bridgewater Triangle. Yeah. And what what he writes about. And um, if you read some of his quotes, it just sounds like he's talking about here. Recently, I discovered that he did hang out in Rehoboth when he was a kid. He Mm -hmm. had a little secret cabin him and his friends used to go to. So it's possible that a lot of the things that he writes about are stem from experiences in the Bridgewater Triangle. Of course, especially if you spend in, in that kind of amount of time you know, in the cab, you know, hanging out or whatever. And I'm sure, you know, you spend a little bit of time or a whole, but something's going <laughs> to, you're going to hear or see something, you know what I mean? For oh, sure. Oh yeah. yeah. When people so, say like, where can I go to have an experience? Like animal on rock. Yeah. Like there's yeah. a very low chance that something's not going to happen, that you're not going to get something in your photographs or something weird is going to happen. No, I think I've only had one visit there where nothing happened and it just looked like a pretty nice place to hike. Every other time, it's just been bizarre. Yeah, no, I agree. I've I've only been there twice. I went last time I went. It was on the anniversary of Anna One's capture this past um, summer, which was fun. I you know it was great. I love like that kind of stuff to see if like you know if you can catch like you know on the anniversary if it's like heightened or something. Uh, so that was cool. But yeah, both times. And then I went like a year before that, in, like the winter time. Um, yeah, both times had, you know, many things happened as far as EVPs and spirit box responses and then just, like intelligent spirit box responses and stuff. Um, Did you take any photos? Away. Um, no, not any photos. I mean, I videoed the whole thing. You know what I mean? So I'm videoing. Did you get anything odd on your videos? Um, not that I noticed. Um, not that I noticed at the time. I have to really like go back and like really look at it again. But no, nothing, that, nothing I noticed like, in the moment or uh, afterwards either. 
Um, but no, tons of audio stuff as far as All right, can you tell me some of the audio stuff? Yeah. Um, so I got, um, I think one of the more fascinating things I got a, uh, a word bank response that said here, here, H E A R right after that EVP, hear me, you know, like, you know, f- directly followed it. I thought that was really interesting. Um, trying to think off the top of my head as far as other EVPs, a bunch of spirit box responses. Um, I think I, I got, we, uh, was it, we love you or I, I think it was, we love you. We love you, Philip. I think they said to me <laughs> at some point, um, but it was weird. The first time I went there, I got told to leave, go home, go away, leave like several times on top, like on top of the rock. Um, the first time I was there, the second time I was there it was like a completely different, like they, they like, I don't know if they accepted me or liked me more the second time I was there. I don't know, but they were definitely more receptive the second time. Um, and then towards the end, um, I'm trying to think, I, I'm, this is so long ago now off the top of my head, but I mean, yeah, just a bunch of things. I got, I got church in the word bank when I was talking about Benjamin church. I thought that was cool. Yeah. I thought that was cool. Um, and there was something else I was talking about Anawan and it said, Oh, it said capture. That's right. The word bank said capture when I was talking about Anawan. And wow. I'm like, I was like, Oh my God. I was like, he was captured. You know what I mean? So like, you know, that those kind of things I love when you're like talking about a story when you're there and then boom, they'll say something to that story. Like I find that stuff like super fascinating myself. Um, so yeah, it was really cool. I just re retold the story of Anawan's capture and then investigated with it. Such an awesome place. But um, I know you've had some other encounters there that are a lot darker than that. Um, Cause I know there is some weird, I got, there was one, uh, one occasion where I got monsters. I think it was monsters or there's a monster here or something like that monster or, or there is, Oh, that's right. That's what it was. There is a demon. That's what it, that's what it said. <laughs> Me and Jason are both yeah. getting deluged with that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I can't, can't Nothing wrong with that. To, yeah, I know. Right. Um, yeah. So I had a really weird, I don't have a spirit box, but I was giving Rosemary Ellen Guiley a tour of the Bridgewater triangle. Do you know who she is? Oh yeah. Yeah, I do. You do. Yeah, so she contacted me like um, about 10 years ago and she said, I've been following you. Uh, you seem to know your stuff. If I came down there, would you be able to take me to the darkest energy spots? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> sure. She wanted to go to rocky, swampy spots where the gin would be. Um, she was working, well, planning on writing a book about the Bridgewater Triangle and her theory was that Pakwajis were a form of gin, mm. as well as a lot of other things that are here in the Bridgewater Triangle. You got to get down, baby. So, anyways, one of our stops was at Anawan Rock. We set up the spirit box, and I have my EMF detector, and the EMF detector seemed to be like responding to her questions. Um, and I was filming the whole thing. Well, the first 10 minutes, Like I'm filming upside down and I'm just freaking out because out of the voice box was my own voice Hmm. for a solid 10 minutes. Years before that, I had done a tour there. And of course I was talking about Benjamin church and this is Benjamin church and my voice. And then the rest of it was kind of like, as if it had recorded just me talking on the telephone, but just me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, sure. It, and she was so calm about it. She was like, oh, it's no big deal. This happened. That It's not that unusual. And I'm like, well, it is to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's the last time I went there. That completely creeped me out. Yep. Yeah. What that yeah, stuff, definitely. what that box told us and what was there and what was looking. It was, yeah. according to her, there was all different levels of things there. There were Native American spirits. There were Pakwajis. There was the jinn. I was, and I did feel like completely watched the whole time. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. And speaking of watch, I know you want to hear about the eyeball, the eye story. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, right. I mean, yeah, I don't know sure. about this. I, I want... <laughs> so in 2009, um, a couple of friends and I were doing a tour of Route 44. We called it the Haunted Route 44 tour. And we were just kind of practicing um, the, you know, the route and stopping at each place. 
coincidentally, Phil, we were there on August 28th, too. We were there for the anniversary. Mm -hmm. And we pull into that little dirt lot, and it's just starting to get dark. And all of a sudden, I see these three flashlights and people just running down the path. And it was a father who was like in his 50s with his two kids. They looked like they were in their 20s. And the father was covered in sweat and visibly shaken. All of them were visibly shaken. And then I was like, can I ask you what happened? They were like, well, we came to, we come down every year for the anniversary. They were locals. Um, and we were, on, we were over in the back of the rock. And then all of a sudden, we saw hundreds of eyes floating in the air, staring at us. Oh, my gosh. And I was like, can you go back in with me? Will you go back in? They were like, no way. Well, I somehow talked them back <laughs> to go in because I was curious if where their experience happened was at the exact spot where Anwan was captured, which is behind the rock. Um I don't know if you noticed this, Phil. It looks like a, a stone terrace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So according to historical records, that's where him and his son were, were sleeping on that terrace. Sure enough, that's where they had their experience. I snapped a few pictures, and I got a big, huge eye in my picture. Hmm. Yeah, that's chilling. That's, I mean, just imagine being that family. You go there all that. You go there every single year. You, you know, you're not expecting to see something like that. And then all of a sudden, something like that happens to you. I'm yeah, I'm surprised. That. I'm actually in retrospect. Surprised they went back. Surprised down there. they went yeah. back in. They they were terrified. Yeah, I, I mean, I would be too. Like, imagine, like. Yeah, me too. Crazy. I was scared yeah. to hear my own voice coming out of a, a voice yeah. box. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's funny you mentioned that because Jason and I had that conversation because you know I I out of everywhere I've been, I've been to the Huckamuck probably the most. And so we were talking about that. It was like, well, 20, 30 years from now, because we were talking about the spirit box and how sometimes it seems, because I've gotten responses like, where are you? That kind of stuff. And I'm like, where am I? What do you mean, where am I? I'm like, right here. Do you not see me? Or like, you know? And so Jason was, we were talking like, oh, is it possible that somehow in the spirit box you're hearing things from the past in the, in the, in the present, you know, as, or things from the future too, possibly. And so... That's like got my mind thinking about like the future stuff or the past stuff. So say if I go back to the Huckamuck 20 years from now, what like like you said, how you caught your own voice on a spirit box, could that happen in the Huckamuck where like I'll catch like another investigation I was doing in that particular day? You well, know, that would be wild. Like, I love that. Right. Yeah. 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 Like it's possible. You know what I mean? Like if you know, it's just it's just something I thought about. You know, I was like, that's interesting. Especially when you were saying you cut your own voice and you you were there in the past doing talking about bending, you know. So, yeah, it was repeating stuff. things that I had said there. Right, You're right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's right. interesting. You like it makes you wonder like what's going on there. You know, is it is it the location that's trapping that memory and replaying it just for you? You know what I mean? Like like I don't know, well, you know, like I, I don't know how that works or what that is, but um it's definitely weird and interesting. So do I, can I tell you one more like it's connected to yeah, that day but um the time I had been there, the last time I had been to the rock before I went with Rosemary, I was there with a couple of other friends. Um, I was on one side of the rock. They were on the other. I had my EMF detector out. I was there for about 20 minutes. Nothing. Nothing was nothing was happening. There was no energy. Um, I wasn't climbing the rock. I was just going around the path. So don't laugh when I tell you I was wearing flip-flops, but I was wearing flip-flops. I didn't feel any pain. I don't remember tripping over anything, but I looked down and my toe, my big toe was gushing blood. The second the blood went into the ground, what do you think happened with my EMF detector? It went, off, off the charts. I was like, um, why do I feel like this land enjoys my blood? This is freaking me out, right? My, and then I called for my friend who is, param, who is a paramedic, and I'm like, um, I, I hurt myself. I don't even know how. We went over, sat down on a bench. He looked at it. He said, I have really bad news for you. You go into the emergency room. Like, you're going to need stitches. And I was like, oh, 
I don't mind the stitches. I just don't, I didn't want to waste eight hours waiting in the emergency. I'm like, Oh, Oh God. I don't, I don't even know how this happened. <laughs> so we get out to the car. I wipe it off. There's nothing. The blood stopped. There's no, not even a scratch on my toe. I'm like, whatever. I don't, I'm just going to forget this happened because it's just too weird. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you've both experienced things like that that are just so bizarre that you're just like, all right, I'm just can't, I'm not going to dwell on this. Like, what's yeah, the yeah. point? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Drive yourself. So crazy. when I was there with Rosemary, Rosemary was asking it about that incident. And it's, she asked it, um, did you, did you take Kristen's blood? And it said, yes. And she said, why did you take Kristen's blood? And it said, I was curious. I was like, all done. (laughs) And then um, she said, if we took some cow's blood and we sprinkled it all over the, the land here, would you like that? It said, just right. Yeah, like I was all done. I'll, I can send you the yeah. Oh, absolutely. video of that. No, it's absolutely. so creepy. Absolutely. I've gotten things like that before in the huck and buck where they've said blood and stuff like that. And, you know, you, or, you know, in the spirit box, I mean, um, and you're just like, uh. <laughs> you know, like it sounds, it sounds as if they were like wanted like blood, like blood sacrifices, you know, essentially is what it sounds like what it was asking. For. Well, she you knows, like, I don't know. I considered, her, you know I, mean? I considered her like the world expert on the paranormal yeah. of all aspects. And if she thought the land wanted blood, I, yeah. I kind of believed her. No, absolutely. You know? uh, well, and the evidence <laughs> points right to that. You know what I mean? Um, which is interesting. You know what I mean? Um, like I said, it just reminds me of like those old school uh, or any type of uh, like old, old religions or like old Testament Bible stuff where they used to sacrifice animals you know, burn it and, you know, like as an offering to, you know, God or whatever, same sort of deal, I guess. Um, it's really interesting. It makes you wonder like who is asking for that? You know, is it the land? Is it another, is one of these entities that are there? Um, you know, it just makes you wonder. Um, obviously answers, we just never know <laughs> the answers right. sometimes, but you know, it's just, it's just like things just sitting around and think about as you're sitting around and by a fire, you know, you're like, what was that? You know, <laughs> you know, you just never know. Um, uh, so many other things to talk about for sure. Jason, do you have a Bridgewater yeah. Triangle yeah. question? Go for it. Yeah. So um, I was looking this up because we you know you were talking about um, you know our speculation about you know hearing your, yourself back playback. So um, it reminded me of the stone tape theory. I don't know if you guys yes. know about the stone tape theory where rocks and stuff can record audio and playback audio, um, or it can record energy, and they think some. Ghosts are recorded images. What's that called, Jason? Uh, stone tape theory. Okay. Th- th- okay. This is the I'm interesting. Like, I'm all over that. I'm going to be yeah. researching that. That's fascinating. Mm-hmm. So this is the ist- inter- very interesting part I just looked up. So in 1837, this guy named Charles Babbage published a work on natural theology called The Ninth Bridgewater Trusty Tr- I can't say that word. It's... It's, I don't know. You'll have to look it up. Uh, Babbage speculated that spoken word leaves permanent impressions in the air, even though they become inaudible after time. So, Hmm. interesting. That's wild. Yeah. Hold on. I mean, how how do you say that word? Hold on. Here, this is the pronunciation. You hear that? What was it? Treatise. 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 Yeah. I don't think I know that word. Ninth Bridgewater Treatise. Ninth Bridgewater Treatise. That's interesting. You have to look that up. Yeah, the stone tape theory is super interesting. Or even I was thinking about that with, um, you know, like the the fort that they had in, in Plymouth that they like demolished and took it apart and then they use it to build. Oh, I don't want to get this wrong, but I feel like it's the Harlow House. Yeah. Right. It's down. That place is creepy. Can you uh, feel the vibes in there? I haven't been inside. I've only been outside. Oh, my God. But that's what I'm saying. It's like, so you have this old fort where these had, you know, the heads of you know, Anawan and King Philip and all this horrible things out. And they used that building and you reclaim that wood to build this other building. So it makes me wonder if the hauntings from the the fort, you know, are with that house too, as well as, as well as whatever happened at that house too, you know, make sure. Yeah, I don't know if there's any hauntings at the house, but the whole yeah. of Plymouth is crazy ass haunted. Absolutely. It is Absolutely. so heavy. Absolutely. Especially sure. like, 
late at night when there's like nothing's open and you're just walking the streets, mm-hmm. you, you just feel it. Oh, especially the the older parts, more like for sure. You know, like uh, Burial Hill, and then like the oldest street. You know, all the- around the yeah, all yeah. around the John Carver Inn. That yeah, yeah that yeah, and, uh, the Brewster mm-hmm. Gardens. Oh yeah, yeah, it's wild. Yeah, yeah we caught some. I've caught some awesome stuff up top on Burial Hill. I mean, even just walking around over near where they have like that mass grave where the the pilgrims are on the hill there in the front. Yeah. I caught just a woman saying saying like uh, some random like a name. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head, but yeah, just like as if she was standing right next to me. And of course, at the time, there's no one there. You know what I mean? There's no one but me and another guy. So I know it's not him. And then we go down the street and he's talking about how someone had to sell this house that used to be a paranormal investigator down there or whatever. And then we get an EVP that says no. And I'm like, (laughs) it's like so weird. And this is just walking around Plymouth, like you said, you know, just walking around Plymouth, just, you know, in some random spot. Um, So, yeah, Plymouth is super super haunted for sure and obviously it's got all the history and all that so um. another place that's um totally underrated as far as ghosts but is so so haunted is provincetown have you ever been to provincetown i've been but not for like ghost stuff you just go you go into like i'll go into a restaurant and i'll be like i'll just ask like the bartender or the waiter where where is the haunting in here and they always be like, oh, upstairs, oh, like every, like, hmm. it's crazy. Yeah, so cool. that's interesting. I never, I, um, I mean, it makes sense. I feel like a lot of places, there's a lot of places like that in Massachusetts that just people don't realize that are haunted. I feel like uh, there's a lot more places like that. Yeah, and it re- was where the pilgrims landed and a lot of people died. Then people don't realize that there was a mass grave in Provincetown too, right in the middle of the street. Hmm. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah I'll have to check that out. If I ever get uh, down there, I have to uh, specifically. Um, well, it's a fun place, you know. But besides the vibes, but yeah, it's it can be creepy. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. It's it is interesting. That's what, like you said, it's one of those things that I don't think a lot of people realize. Yeah, like you said, the pilgrims like basically landed there first, and they were there for a little while. And they're like, ah, eh, this is not, this isn't going to work for us. So then they kind of um, worked their way over to Plymouth, and then like, oh, okay. Because they were deciding, I was on the Mayflower 2 earlier in the year, and they have this thing where they set up and they're like, oh, the pilgrims are thinking about three different locations, and one of them was Plymouth, one of them was maybe Martha's Vineyard or Nantucket or something. Then they had like pros and cons of all these different places where they could live and, you know, the benefits and all that kind of stuff. And so, uh, you know what? The story changes every year. Yeah, I bet it does. And so like, I, like, I remember oh, when my kids were like in third and fourth grade. One of the, I can't remember which one of them had this on their homework, mm-hmm. but it was like around Thanksgiving and they had homework. And the question was, why did the pilgrims come to, P- to Plymouth? Mm-hmm. And it was like multiple choice. And none of the right answers were on it. And my kids, <laughs> are, you know, they're my kid, my kids. So they know the real the real history. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So yeah. they're like, "Mommy, we don't know what to like. I don't know what to say. Like, yeah, the right answer is not on here." <laughs> and I said, "Say, a storm blew it over. <laughs> That's what they're looking for." She's like, yeah. "But it's not the right answer." I'm like, "Who cares? That's what your teacher wants." And that was the right answer. <laughs> that a storm blew it over. <laughs> I mean, they had maps uh, of the entire. Yeah coast yeah, yeah right yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and they acted like everything was found by accident yeah oh whoops it was... yeah it's you know it, whatever <laughs> Plymouth is a uh, very very mysterious place and it holds yes. a lot of keys mm-hmm. oh yeah absolutely yeah because yeah, it's where it's where you know the the colony started and everything so that's where everyone started and kind of branched out from there um yeah it's 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 definitely a super i love plymouth it's it's an awesome i do too i would love to live there oh you know what's really actually i'm glad you're on what's really weird so i it kind of actually kind of might make sense because near plymouth plantation where currently plymouth plantation is somewhere in that area maybe the parking lot area from what i understand as far as what the book was saying yes it's the parking lot yes it there was a garrison house there yeah in a battle yes and a lot of people died and there was a boy named Tom who got maimed and then they put a silver plate in his head and then he was forever known as silver headed Tom or so stop silver- it. I've never yeah. heard that. Yes. Oh my God. And so, what? Well, so I went there for Thanksgiving or well, near Thanksgiving time. Cause I'm like, it's, I've, I loved it. I went there as a kid, obviously a lot of, and if anyone that grew up in mass has probably been to Plymouth plantation, 
So basically, for those who don't know what Clint Plantation is, Jason is like looking at me like yeah. I have no idea what we're talking about. So basically, it's like this area where they set it up just like as if the pilgrims had just, you know, the first couple of years that they're living there. So it's like set up like 1600 style. So it's like they, they're they dressed in period clothes. They talk like as if they're pilgrims. They'll teach you stuff. Um, they have a whole like Wampanoag section now where they have like a little mock village and stuff. It's a cool little experience, you know, for those who haven't um, done it before. Um, so... I just did it. I was just going to do it like as a vlog, but I had the word bank going and stuff like that. Cause like, you never know what you yeah. might catch there. And I knew the garrison helped. So I was like, okay, there might be a connection here. We might get some activity. What's weird. The weirdest part is we got an EVP. It was inside Plymouth uh, plantation. And it was, um, the, it was a woman. And she said, turn that off or turn that thing off. <laughs> and like basically wow. talking about like my camera, like she yeah. didn't want my camera on. And I'm like, that's kind of weird. So like, got my mind thinking i was like well maybe it's like a um old school plant plantation worker who's like back in the day maybe they didn't allow any modern technology yeah. and so they're like what are you doing you can't use that here like this is all supposed to be period stuff you know what i mean yeah. blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. like that's what i was thinking it as but it was just um just a cool little moment hmm. um but yeah such a um i love the uh silver headed tom story um the very fact that he's like one of the only survivors and they put a little silver head a plate in his head and he survives, but that's, that's amazing. Can I ask you where you read that? Because I want to yeah, read that. It was in the um the King Philip um oh was it Shul? What's the name of the book? I'll pull it up right now because I have it on my audio audible. Which I'm gonna call it. Um, it's like the only. It's like the. It's like the most famous Bridgewater tribe. Is it the Tagaius book? Uh yeah. Let's see. It's this one. Yeah, by Eric B. Schultz. Yeah, Michael uh, J. Talag Tagus. Yep. Okay. It's that one. Yeah, yeah, it's in that one. That that's my favorite King Philip War book by far. It's just so detailed. I want to get the because I just have the audio audible version, so I don't have like the physical copy that has like the maps and all that. I'm sure you probably have it on your. <laughs> She's on your like, show. wait a second, I got it right here. <laughs> so this book right here, it's called Indian History, Biography, and Genealogy pertaining to the Good Sachem Massasoit of the Wampanoag Tribe and his descendants by Ebenezer Pierce, published by Zerviah Gould Mitchell. And um, she was known as the last Wampanoag. She was a direct descendant to Massasoit. And oh, cool. she published this book and she provided all the information. But in the 1800s, as a Native American half black woman, she knew nobody would read it. So she had a what? Like she was smart enough to have a white person's name on it. Mm-hmm. But all of the information is hers as all about King Philip's war and has the most amazing footnotes. Okay. Like you got to check out, you can get it on Amazon. They, they put it on Amazon like eight years ago, which was like, it's, it's my favorite King Philip's war book. It's the best resource. That's awesome. I like the Mayflower to Mayflower to Phil book. It's really like user friendly, easy to read. Yep. Um, and then, you know, I go sometimes to find locations. I go through um, church's diary. And actually, in, yes, in here yes. too, the footnotes in here give out a lot of locations. But the footnotes in um, Church's diary give out a lot of the locations. So I've been able to figure out where some things are. Like I've, yes. I figured out where the Bridgewater Pound was. Like oh, the day that they captured um, all the women and children that were hiding in the swamp, not the yes. Hawksmoth Swamp, but in, in a swamp near, not that far away. And King Philip's son and his wife were taken. Yep. Oh, um, interesting. Then the rest of them were, were taken to the pound. And nobody knows where the pound is. Like, the historical site doesn't even know where it is. Mm-hmm. But I'm like a hound dog, and I found I found out where it is. I guess I have to get the historical society to, you know, listen to me and how I figured this out and how I know for a fact that this is the location. But there's no house there. You should investigate there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. If you if you give me that, if you yeah, if you send it to me, I'll definitely go there. Yeah, there's nothing there. And as far as I know, I didn't see any no trespassing signs. And I thought it was really interesting because it was in a neighborhood where all those ho- houses all up and down both sides of the street. But this one spot where it was, where the pound was, is just this grassy area. And I wonder like if at some time they like the town knew it and it was just like protected in some way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. Make, yeah. It makes you wonder for sure. 
Um, yeah, because you have to send me that book too, because I definitely will all have to buy that too. Oh yeah, it's fantastic. I I I started to do read uh, Church's Diary. I'm got only like a fourth of the way through it, so I haven't even got all the way through it yet. Um, but yeah. yeah, he's he's a super fascinating subject in the Bridgewater Triangle. He's probably one of my favorite um, characters in, in King Philip's War. Um, just to, like all the stuff he did, it did he did a lot and wrote a lot down, which helps. Um, yeah, he was a boaster though, and oh yeah, oh, yeah. he was a, he. Absolutely. was able to win the war for the colonists by lying. Mm -hmm. He lived in, um, you probably know this, but he lived in Rhode Island amongst tri the tribes, mm -hmm. and they were all very friendly. They trusted him. And every single occasion when he captured someone, he promised clemency. He promised that they would not be killed. And even, like, in the, I think it was Tuspequin, even promised, like, not only will we let you live. Like, we're going to make you, like, part of our army. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yep. Oh, yeah. Off with their heads. Every single time they were called to court, Benjamin Church was called to Boston. Every single time. If you read between the lines, I mean, he was kind of snaky. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But he was good yeah. at what he did. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Absolutely. And, yeah, he, and he used the help of of Wampanoags and stuff too. You know what I mean? As far as the, and the army. And so that's how we, they were able to do so many things and track and stuff. Even when I was, uh, the Anawan, uh, when they captured Anawan, I was reading this in this other book. They were saying that, um, an older Wampanoag was like leading them to Anawan rock. And he was outpacing all of the younger men. And this guy was like 80 something years old, this mm -hmm. Wampanoag. And so he would like go way ahead of them and then like wait at the top of a hill and then wait for Benjamin Church and the other guys to, like, catch up to him. And then they'd be like, okay. And then, so then, they, <laughs> so, like, it's just amazing to me that, like, you know, here, like, Benjamin Church, these guys are all, like, young guys, you know, strapping guys, supposed to be. And, like, there's this, like, old Wampanoag man, like, outpacing them and, like, going way ahead of them and, like, you know, like, you know, working right around them. And I'm like, that's kind of fascinating. Um, that's, like, like just a little quick little tidbit that I was like. Yeah, I and know. that reminds me of um, one of the cool footnotes in, in this book. Um, it talks about Weedamu, who was King Philip's uh, sister-in-law, um, also a sachem. She sent one of her squaws all the way to Maine by herself because they were starving to go get corn. Hmm. And the girl just went and came back, and she was back within a week. It was just so different. <laughs> yeah, right? Imagine, imagine, yeah, you just go by foot, go to Maine, no big deal. All by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And like back then too, you know, it's not like nowadays where you could drive there. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, she's taking footpaths and stuff, you know, like, you know, and I'm, you know, in dangerous territories and stuff, I'm sure. Um, so yeah. Absolutely. So wow. I do have to um, mention that the, the native Americans that fought on the side of the colonists were not Wampanoag. They were in the yep. Massachusetts tribe. Oh, like the ones from the uh, from the northern northern right, the mass the mass. Um, right? the territories have gotten mixed up. The Massachusetts territory was actually all the way from the Charles River all the way down to like Plymouth. Okay, okay, gotcha. Um, and then after the Wasagusset massacre, which was their tribe, mm -hmm. where it was like a year or two after the Pilgrims got here, the writing was on the wall, and their chief decided to surrender to the colonists like he, he was like he just wanted his people to be able to survive but in order to survive they had to cut their hair they were not allowed to speak um algonquin they had to speak english um they had all kinds of rules and the the punishment was death hmm. so for a long time i wondered how did indians fight indians you know but then I was thinking about it. You had one tribe that were like almost like slaves, right? Mm -hmm. And no longer could pray to their creator and their gods anymore. And they had to totally assimilate to, you know, British culture. Then you got the, another tribe that lives right near them that are completely free for 50 years. I think a lot of resentment might build up in that time. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. So I, I think like finally I re like figured out or accepted why, you know, the Massachusetts tribe fought with the colonists. 
because it was a Massachusetts, I believe, that killed King Philip, right? John Alderman? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, Mm -hmm. it was. Yeah. And if it wasn't for the Massachusetts tribe, or maybe there could have been some defectors from the Wampanoags too. I just haven't heard of any. Yeah. They, the natives would have won the war because there was no way that they would have found anybody without help guiding them through the swamps and oh, the forests. 100%. Hmm. Yeah. 100% correct. Absolutely. I mean, they were outmatched. I mean, even just like the, 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 the native native Americans just were so much better at the, at the gun than the English were because the English used the gun to, as like sport, and like hunting, whereas like the you know, Wampanoags and the other Native Americans, they use it to hunt and in daily life. You know, they use that gun every single day to provide for their their tribe and their families and stuff. So like they were they were so much better at the the rifle. Not only that, I believe they also had the mat lo- matchlock rifles, and so they had the better rifle than the the Pilgrims had. The, the Pilgrims still had the old style rifle, which is like a like a, a, a like the older version the, before the matchlock, uh, maybe flintlock. Whatever it is, I can't remember the exact terminologies, but um, they, you know, so they were, they were so much better at tracking, so much better at warfare, so much better at all of that stuff than we, you know, than the English were by far, because the English were just farmers, you know, half of the, <laughs> half of the. And they were terrified. They were like yeah. not used to this terrain at all. No, not at all. And like all, all the there farmers... are no swamps in England. No. no. So no, they were like ho- like absolutely horrified. One yeah. of the first orders of business in Bridgewater was setting wolf traps. They were terrified of the wolves inside of the swamps, and there were a lot of them. Oh yeah, no, that I do believe that that I could imagine for sure, definitely. Are there um, um, any wolves left in the Bridgewater Triangle or up there in general? Just coyotes, and we do have some um, wolf coyote hi- like hybrids. Koi, yeah, koi, koi wolves, wolves or whatever yeah. they is call that what they call. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, definitely. But I've not that I know of. I'm not saying that they're not. They don't exist because in the Bridgewater Triangle we have had beluga whales, um, camus, uh, cougars, mountain lions. Um, baby seals. I could go on and on. So there could be wolves here. Why yeah. not? <laughs> Absolutely. You never know. Yeah. You never know. Up in um, Hudson, Massachusetts, I saw a bobcat a few weeks ago. Oh wow. Yeah. So I hope like, you weren't in the woods. No, no. We were. We were doing like. A, um. I was. It was working, and I was driving. It was just like seven o'clock in the morning. We were driving through like a desolate kind of parking lot on top of a kind of like hilly, mountainy kind of you know area. And um, you was just literally chilling on the grass, just acting like a normal cat, like a cat you're cleaning himself, looking around, you know, walking around, doing things. Like, he literally looked just like a regular cat would, just a lot bigger. And like, you know, the short tail like a bobcat has and all that stuff. Absolutely incredible. I yeah, I don't want to run into anything like that no. while I'm hiking. No. I'm, I'm kind of nervous about this spring and this summer with all the bears that we had. Mm, it's like they've just bear- been in hibernation, right? Yes. Yes. They were all over the place. Yes, we had, and one of them, they yes. in my town, yeah, they killed. Mm-hmm. It was oh, really? massive, and it was going into barns and dragging out goats. Oh, and I think the God. concern was like, what if you know, pets and little kids, and it, the thing was getting a little aggressive. The other ones, they all like were all protected, but at first they were like, "There's one bear in the area." No, we are lousy with bears now. Yeah, and yeah, I gotta get bear spray. I'm not going to stop going in the woods. <laughs> no, no, me neither. But no, I was, I thought about that because you're right. It was, it was last summer because I, I was at somewhere in Middleborough and they had just had a sighting in Lakeville earlier that mm-hmm. day or something like that, which is a town over Jason for you to, you know, know okay. that, but it's like literally a town over. And you, like she said, this is not a place where like normally we have bears like that. Like usually that's like a New Hampshire thing or like a Western mass thing maybe, but like, Past few years, we've had a lot, like a lot of bear sightings, or, or bear, like every single summer now, like more and more and more. So, so I they, would not be surprised if yeah. there's bears in the Huckamuck. Are they you know black I mean? bears? Black yes, bears? black bears. Okay. Yep, yep, black bears. Me and <laughs> me and Jason <laughs> had a close encounter with a black bear right in front of his car in Tennessee, like yeah. in April, yeah, or May. No, no, November. Wasn't. Yeah, it was November. Yeah, November. yeah, that's right. Yeah, so we're like literally doing a live stream. We're like d- talking to the camera. All of a sudden, I look up and there's just a bear walking across the front of the car. Looks over at us. Just looks right into my eyes and then keeps on going. 
Oh, it was boy. So weird. Yeah, I was like, oh my god. And then later that night, <laughs> to top it off, then we see uh, at least two koi wolves up in the mountains of in Tennessee after we had just got done doing this like a abandoned cabin, like maybe a mile and a half away from where these wolves are. We're like, yeah. oh, that's cool. So like, you know, they definitely were coming towards us for sure. You know, like, oh, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> is um, Tennessee beautiful? Yes. Oh, yeah, it's, it's you awesome. have to go. It's absolutely stunning. What is Jason saying? It's awesome. I, I love it here. I've been really? Here, yeah, I've been here. Because I'm life. looking to get out of Massachusetts. Tennessee is a great place. For real. And it's, and it's very haunted. Yeah. 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 So won't be missing anything. No, <laughs> no. Like it'd be a whole new adventure for you. It'd be like a whole, you know, all new legends, all new, you know, but they do have a little puck wudgy stuff there. So you'd have yeah. a little bit of home with you coming with you. <laughs> but do you yeah. live near mountains. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, the mountains are about 20 minutes from a house. Oh, that uh, sounds great. Yeah. Um, no, but- it's, it's an awesome spot. He, he lives near like, the Gatlinburg, uh, Pigeon Forge, so like the Smoky Mountains area. Absolutely. Oh, okay. Gorgeous. That's My parents went like, to the woods. Smoky Mountains. Oh, they said yeah. it was one of the most beautiful places they had ever been. Yeah. I agree. I agree. I've only I, I've been there twice. I must go now. <laughs> yes, you have to. And Dollywood's there too. So yep. you can oh, do cool. Dollywood. Yeah, so you can do Dollywood as well. Dollywood was awesome. Um, highly recommend. There's a lot of like fun stuff to do down there too. So it's not like, you know, it is beautiful, but there's like, you know, there's things to do so you don't get bored and it, you'll have a great time down there. I sound, I sound like I'm a, a spokesperson for like Tennessee now. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, come down to travel down Tennessee, folks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, no, this has been absolutely awesome. Thank you for coming on. Um, we'll have to have you on again. I know. Yeah, you're- this was fun. It flew oh, by, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, right. I was yeah. like, I, yeah. down, I was like looking down. I'm like, all right, it's almost already 930 or just about 930. I'm like, wow, time flies. Uh, but no, such an awesome conversation. We're glad we had you on. Um, thank you and so much. It was much. so good to meet you finally. Yeah, absolutely. I you thoroughly too. respect your work. I love it. Thank you so much. And you you too as well. You're like, you're a, plethor- a plethora of knowledge. Um, so I'm excited to learn as much as I can from you. Um, and we'll definitely have to have you back on. I know you have other things you want to talk about as well. So yeah, we'll sure. Have you back on to talk about that stuff as well. Yeah, it was, All right. it was great having you on. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And um, I, I'm, I know I didn't talk a lot, but I listened and I learned a lot about your guys' area, and it was it was great. I enjoyed it. Oh, thank you so much. Absolutely. It was I nice mean, to meet you, Jason, and you, Phil, officially. Yeah, absolutely. Is there anything you want to plug before we head out? Um, um, just um, be following me on my Facebook page. Mm-hmm. I'm hoping to get the book out by June. Awesome. And wow. after that, it's quickly two others are going to follow. Awesome. So what if what, when you do get the book out, we'll have you back on to promote that as well. Sounds great. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate awesome. that. Yeah, awesome. Definitely. Absolutely. Awesome. All Thank right, you so guys. Yeah, have a good night. It. Thank yeah, you. you. All right. Thank yep. you. Bye. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Well, that's going to wrap it up for this episode, guys. A huge shout out to Kristen again for coming on. Kristen Evans, please check out our, our all our socials. It's going to be in the, the notes of this episode. Um, by the time this comes out, it'll be... After Easter, right? Or before Easter? Yeah, it'll be after Easter. Yeah. It'll be after Easter. So, okay, well, happy Easter in the past. Uh, but, yeah, right now it's not pre-Easter, so it's kind of weird. But, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, um, obviously make sure you guys support Fat Tech. They're our only sponsor. They've been with us since the beginning. Not really, but I'm just saying it now because it since sounds cool to say that. you started the show, they've been with us. That's right. So they've so, been yeah. with me. They've been with us since the beginning. Um, so a big shout out to them. Make sure you guys support them, follow them on their socials, give them some love on the socials. Be like, Hey, we followed you from AFK. We're checking out your products or buying your products. Make sure you let them know that AFK just sent you all that stuff. Follow us on all the socials, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. You guys know the places. Please follow us there. And five, star we'll review, you. Guys. five Oh yeah. Five star reviews on Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you listen to this. And we will see you next week. Peace. Peace, guys. Ripping through the ages, you are. I see through you and your darkness.